Morning, everyone. Um, that title is, is a mouthful. Um, the, main, the main title is a little bit sort of unsexy, but, but traffic is a very funny sort of word. I mean, if you're in the web industry, you love traffic. If you're in the transport industry, you hate traffic. And um, we, we speak about it in this sort of strange third-person abstracted way, like the traffic was terrible this morning. Not, not me and the traffic were terrible. The traffic that I contributed to were terrible this morning. But um, if you write a book about traffic, you get labeled a traffic expert, which always makes me feel a little bit weird. I, Reminds me of those 1970s ads, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. Um, I'm not, not a traffic engineer, I was just a writer, and, and sort of a driver like, like most of you, I'm sure, in this room, a kind of self-loathing driver, a little bit curious about some of the behavior I was seeing out on the road all these years. And I, so I traveled the world, spent a few years talking to traffic experts of various stripes uh, around the world. And what they will tell you is that you know, the moment you have a driver's license, that essentially turns you into a traffic expert. And if you look at uh, websites like uh, Yelp now, people are beginning to rate things like traffic signals. Uh, this was in, the, in Honolulu. It was given two stars. Um, one of the comments suggests that the entire uh, city's tra transportation department should be fired for the placement of this uh, certain, certain traffic signal. But, and I've spent a lot of time on public radio you know, doing these interviews with people trying to, trying to counsel the public that things like roundabouts, for example, which um, in the state of Wisconsin, Republican legislators were, were calling these essentially traffic circles of death, uh, trying, trying to counsel them that no, these are actually good for you. And so there's a lot of misinformation out there. And I think you know, Adam Savage could do an entire season of Mythbusters purely on driving and traffic uh, myths. Um, yeah, I don't need to remind you that um, we live in a car culture, sort of saturated country here in America. but. Um, the book has been published in many different countries around the world, which shows that this is really now a universal condition. There's no country that really doesn't suffer from traffic and the automobile, the, the sort of negative externalities, as we call it. Um, Russian edition just came out. Uh, you know, a few decades ago, the word driver in Russia was something you did for a living. It did not, did not uh, talk about the private person. You want to see how that's working out, go to YouTube and type in Russian dash cam videos, and um, you'll have a pretty fun afternoon. But um, just one moment. You know, the, the, idea of like kind of being lost in translation, the German edition came out and it was called Auto, and I was a little bit curious why it was not called Traffic. It's not really a book about the car, it's about traffic. I'm a writer, I'm obsessed with language. I called up the publisher, said, why did you go with this and not Traffic? And he said, well, Tom, you know, in German, the word uh, Traffic is actually synonymous with the word for intercourse. Um, <laughs> and I, I'd spent a few moments suggesting why this semantic slippage it might not actually be a bad thing for my sales figures. And, then you start to, the mind starts to think about German workplaces on a Monday morning, like, hi, hey, Hans, how was the traffic this morning, and um, all sorts of, and then you read about the German birth rate declining, and you sort of wonder, like, hey, something else going on there, but we've all sort of had this moment, and this is what started the book, a really, really stupid moment on a New Jersey highway. I was, one of those construction work zone merges, the sign said, merge right one mile. There was a long lane of cars that were sort of getting over early in the lane that was going to continue through. I was one of those law-abiding, what I thought was law-abiding people, got over early, went through, and noticed after a few days of doing the same behavior repeatedly that there was all this real estate in the left lane and that a few drivers were taking advantage of that space, going all the way to the merge point, fighting their way back in. So one day I felt like the system was sort of gaming me, so I jumped in the left side, went all the way to the front. I felt pretty bad about this. My wife was in the front seat. She was like sort of covering, her, covering her hands. People were giving me nasty looks. Later, I, I started asking people, on, on Metafilter and other places and friends, you know, what, was what I did actually wrong? Or was, you know, was there, did I make congestion worse? Or is there something, could the system be set up in a better way to uh, actually move more traffic through there? So I started ex investigating. It turns out there's something called dynamic late merge, a technology that's been tried in, in various states that sort of, you set up the system so you tell people to stay in each lane until the merge point, then do a one-on-one -on -one zipper merge. It's used in Germany, it's used in different places around the country. Uh, but, you know, people feel weird about this. In Minnesota, they've tried this, and people will not stay in the left lane to the merge point. They get over. They think it's somehow being wrong. Uh, people in Minnesota are essentially, essentially too nice. But um, the main lesson I learned, you know, from this situation is that the individual driver cannot often understand the larger uh, traffic system. And the thing about this system is it actually moved more traffic through the bottleneck than the traditional sort of good behavior of law-abiding drivers. And when I talk about late merge, I'm not talking about sort of getting into a highway off-ramp at the last minute when there's a queue. That's sort of clearly bad behavior. This is the idea of taking more efficient use of spare uh, real estate on the highway. So but this idea of moving people around, moving through cities is, is as old as, as cities themselves. This image comes from Pompeii. 
you see uh, there, there's the sort of uh, wear patterns from where carts were being taken down the street on horses. Yeah, there's also a nice accommodation made here for pedestrians that can walk over those blocks. The carts go right through the blocks. Everyone wins. Uh, cut forward a few centuries in uh, 16th century Europe. Uh, you see the emergence of these things called the sedan chair or the horse-drawn limousine, and these words are, are very suggestive of our current automobile culture, and it sort of suggests how long this has been going, going on for. And what's interesting is this was a, kind of an enormous social change going on here. This was the first time the emergence of these devices that you could go through public space in a private setting. And so not only did you have to change cities spatially to, to accommodate these new technologies, you had to have some social change, and it raised new etiquette questions. You know, was it a, how did you escort a lady to and from a sedan chair? Was it polite for a person outside of the sedan chair to look inside? And if two people, two drivers came at once to the same intersection, who was going to go first? Was it the person who got there first? Higher social status? Who was going faster? Uh, you know, cut forward to Shanghai last year. These sorts of issues are still going on today, uh, just with different sorts of vehicles, but uh, sort of age-old problems. Now, and traffic, you know, in the world of engineers and modelers, it is this sort of self-organized, complex system. They talk about phase transitions of going from liquids to solids. And you can think about it that way, but what I was really interested in was the, the human factor, the way we as humans get in the way of those perfect models with our own quirky behavior. And one of these, um, some Dutch engineers I know, rented a uh, helicopter and waited for a crash to happen on a Dutch freeway. And luckily, this was a non-fatal uh, van rollover. But it's interesting, the top segment there, you see the van has flipped over. There's a clear reason why the capacity has been reduced by 11%. Uh, people are actually having to move over into an extra lane. There's a merging process happening. We know how well merging happens. But what's interesting is way across that big median strip there on the bottom segment, they're also having an 11% capacity reduction with no physical obstruction. There is that essentially a mental bottleneck. People are slowing to look at what's going on well across that median strip. And they found that, that people actually moved, kind of emerged out of the stop and go traffic more slowly than during normal stop and go congestion, sort of indicating a distractive effect, or as I think, really pausing to contemplate their own mortality before moving on. So and we all sort of know this happens. It's just nice to see it quantified and, and set up so elegantly. Now, another question I had was, you know, you know, was traffic the result of there always being too many people trying to occupy too much space at the same time, or because of a physical bottleneck, or cars coming onto an on-ramp, or was there something about the way we as humans drove ourselves that actually made traffic congestion worse? Japanese physicists, in a very famous experiment, rented a closed circular track, which we see here, and they asked drivers to drive up to 30 kilometers an hour and then maintain a steady speed and following distance. And we see that people, you know, the system eventually began to break down pretty quickly. People have trouble maintaining a steady speed. They drive a little bit too close to the person in front of them. They hit the brakes. The person behind them doesn't know quite how fast they're, they're uh, decelerating, so they overcompensate. And the sort of perturbations in the system begin to emerge which grow larger, uh, and there's sort of a shock wave that happens traveling back up the circle at uh, 11 miles an hour. So the funny thing about traffic congestion is you're not, you're not driving into a traffic jam. A traffic jam is basically driving into you on the highway. There's a reverse shock wave going up and down. So you know, a perfect self-generating traffic jam that humans have, have generated. There's a way to work a way out of this puzzle, which, you know, of course, People over at Google with their famous autonomous car uh, project have been working on this is a car that could maintain a steady speed and following distance for uh, as long as there was basically fuel in the tank. And I spent a few years, different, situ different iterations of this car sitting in the back seat. One was 2010 ITS conference in New York City. It drove down 10th Avenue. It was closed to traffic. So it was pretty interesting. You had stopped for traffic signals, which a lot of New York City drivers don't actually do. So in some ways, it was already a pretty amazing achievement. But Cut to you know, a few months ago, I was in the back seat of the latest uh, version of this car on a California public highway, not that far from here. Um, you know, sitting in the back seat, no one at the wheel, no one manipulating the speed. You see here the view. Uh, and at the beginning, I was a little bit nervous, I was, <laughs> as anyone would be, but then I started looking at the drivers around me, the people texting while driving, the people changing lanes without signaling, the people weaving for no apparent reason. Uh, and it, it was them that I began to feel afraid of and really began to feel quite comfortable in the back of this car. Because it, it is an amazing piece of technology. It not only knows when another car is in its blind spot, as most high-end cars you know, now do, it can tell when it's in the blind spot of another car and sort of automatically position itself. So uh, interesting you know, future we're heading toward, which would really uh, you know, solve a lot of issues on the road. So 
you know, being in a car changes us, and you, you read enough transport surveys, and you see there's often a footnote saying, specifying where they talk to people when they interview them about their transportation decisions. Because if they were on foot, they would probably give one answer. If they were in the car, they might give a different answer, even if they're both a pedestrian and a driver. Being in the car essentially changes who we are in all sorts of ways. I mean, the main thing about, about driving is that uh, we, we're moving around as anonymous actors. And, and without sort of the traditional mechanisms for society, gossip, reputation, uh, feedback, eye contact. Uh, it, it's not really a system that's really set up for uh, harmonious interaction. Uh, yet we, we, you know, we spend, spend our days looking at people's rear ends, which is not at all how we're optimized to communicate. And here you can see the, the, the kind of logical end of the honor student um, uh, bumper sticker trope, which has uh, found its... But you know, especially in the US, we're, we're always trying to send messages to people in, in sort of desperate hopes that they'll, they'll receive them, because I think we're, we're, we're missing all these other things. Uh, we rely instead on a variety of sort of mental heuristics and, and shortcuts to make decisions about other people and how we should behave in traffic. This is a guy named Ian Walker in England who's a traffic psychologist who's in my book quite a bit. And he did this interesting experiment. He set his, equipped his bicycle up with a device to measure the speed and distance of uh, vehicles as they passed him. And he set himself up in a number of different experimental conditions. He wore a helmet, then he didn't wear a helmet, then he put on a sort of a pink shirt and a bad wig and, and declared himself a female cyclist without a helmet. Um, and you know, the, the patterns of behavior by drivers were not random. When he had the helmet on, people drove very close to him. When he took the helmet off, they drove, gave him a little bit more space. When he became a woman and took the helmet off, they gave him the most space of all. And so in all those cases, drivers were making decisions on the fly about how competent or you know, what, what behavior they should expect from this uh, cyclist. If you stop those drivers a mile later and ask, why did you do that? They probably have no memory of doing this. It's beneath subconscious reasoning, we're just do which is how much of traffic behavior actually uh, occurs. We don't have time for nice uh, reflective ideas about how competent he is as a cyclist. Uh, and, you know, the, what's interesting about traffic, New York City, of course, um, tr traffic, you know, beyond a tr sort of massive transportation system, it's, a, it's an a giant applied psychology laboratory in real time. And there's a lot of experiments that were done going back to the 70s about how people act, for example, at traffic lights. One, one, one classic experiment, the way you do it is you, you have a car at a red light, you wait for the light to turn green, you position someone nearby and have them record the vehicle behind you and see how quickly they honk, how many times they honk, and how long each honk is. Was it sort of an angry, you know, lean on the horn? Was it a polite tap? And again, we see that these patterns are not random. Men honk more quickly than women. Uh, people driving more expensive cars honk more quickly than more, uh, those driving more modest vehicles. People in convertibles, uh, less likely to honk than those in enclosed cars. Again, I think that having less of that anonymity, feeling more of a human connection with the person in front of them. And you, you, can, you can set these experiments up in all sorts of different ways. In Australia, they, had, uh, they looked at how willing would you be to let another driver in ahead of you from a minor junction as you were nearing a, a, a red light. So it's sort of a, an experiment in social altruism. How, how much would you give up a little bit of your own time for the sake of someone else who you were not related to, who was not going to do something for you in return, who you were likely never to see again? Again, you see a number of interesting uh, patterns here, which you can draw your own conclusions about what that says about society. But, um, one variable that, that was not raised in that study was the idea of eye contact. I mean, you've all had this experience of, of getting someone's eye and they wave you in when you're trying to get into traffic. And it feels, feels very powerful, it sort of awakens these deep, I think, altruistic impulses. We, we all lived in very small uh, groups around the world. But Ian Walker, again, the image on the left, I think even people in the back can probably tell that something's a little bit strange about that image on the left. What it is is that his eyes, one of his eyes is shifted by a few pixels out of a screen of, of hundreds. And it just you know, shows how sensitive we are to picking out this eye contact. Why are we so sensitive to it? It's an important tool in gaining social cooperation. That's why we have so much white in our eyes, so people can see where we're looking, what they want us to do, what we want them to do. Psychologists hook up people to eye tracking software, show them a picture of a car, the first place they look is the eyes, which um, resemble, uh, the, the headlights, which resemble human eyes. Uh, my favorite example of the power of eye contact, eye contact was a Experiment in a university break room that they're having trouble with people paying for coffee. It was an honor system. They weren't get, donating enough money to replenish the coffee. And uh, so they put above the coffee machine one image, uh, one week an image of human eyes, flowers, eyes, flowers. Uh, they found that donations soared uh, on the weeks when human eyes uh, were present. And um, I mean, the, the lesson here is that the, also the, scary, the scarier the eyes, the, the, the higher the compliance. Um, so, 
don't have to be real eyes. Just the picture of human eyes is enough to, in, to sort of will us toward compliance. Would this sort of thing work in traffic? It's, um, <laughs> it's an actual traffic sign found in the city of uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, part of an artistic traffic calming uh, exercise, which is actually quite interesting because these are, these are non-standard signs, obviously, but studies have found that the closer you are, are to your own home, the more likely you are to violate traffic signals. It's sort of a familiarity effect and, and a bit of highway hypnosis in a way. You're so used to that environment. What can we put in this environment to remind you that you're in a human place, there might be people around, to essentially uh, wake you up a little bit? So uh, what, this is a, a JPEG. You know, the image isn't moving. What's really moving are your eyes. If you stare at the black dot, you can make the, the image stop. But it's, I just like, I love illusions. And then the, the present on the road as well in all sorts of ways and in really higher stakes than, than simple sort of parlor games here because we're moving at these high speeds beyond which we were really evolutionarily adapted to handle. A uh, great example here is um, it looks like these two boxes are, looks like they're shuffling, right? If you look really carefully, they're actually both moving at exactly the same speed. There's a contrast problem here. When the dark one crosses the light, it looks like it's going slower. Uh, what does this have to do with traffic? Um, fog is a great example in traffic of a, a low contrast situation. And you hear on the news about these large chain reaction crashes with hundreds of cars, and you think, well, it must be a simple visibility problem. But I would suggest what's really happening is, and this is a study done in Australia, two, two images of driving, the first one plain, the second one a layer of fog, was sort of su uh, simulated fog was superimposed upon there. Uh, students were asked uh, which one is going faster. Of course, the driver in both of these is going at exactly the same speed, but because of that low contrast environment, it makes us feel like we're going slower than we really are, which is exactly what's happening in fog. We're all sort of suffering from a collective uh, visual hallucination, if you will. Another problem, uh, we'll need some space bar on this one, I think, is you know, we often have trouble estimating the speed and distance of objects that are coming uh, from far away. And um, the train has, you know, you're paused at a, at a railway crossing, the train kind of hangs out there on the horizon for quite a long time. It doesn't really seem to be growing appreciably larger in size or speed until sort of the last few seconds of this, I think, 17 second uh, approach. And there's a, a problem here in that the sort of our angle of viewing the, the rate of change is a nonlinear process. It only begins to appreciably change in the last few seconds. And you can sort of see the real world implications of this when you study uh, surveillance footage at places like railway crossings. You know, at which people are making really you know, bad decisions based on sort of imperfect information. And um, and when I was watching this footage, I, I thought, well, all these are a lot of these are unmarked crossings with not enough lights. But a study here in California found that uh, a full one in five fatal uh, crashes occurred at very well marked. Uh, I'm sorry, the majority happened at very well marked and lighted. Uh, crashes. One fifth of, of fatal train crashes involve the car hitting the side of the train. So there's, it's a very complicated environment. Uh, just a simpler idea. That, I mean, the more of the road you can see, the further away the car ahead of you will look. This uh, car is the same distance from the driver in both photos. What's happening in the bottom is the guy is seated on a few phone books. An experiment done by General Motors in the 70s. And you know, this, if anyone who drives an SUV or sort of a taller vehicle, you'll be getting less of that feedback from the road. You'll feel like you're going slower than you really are. Um, one last illusion, if you stare at the X in the center very intently, stare at the X very, this is not a mass hypnosis experiment, but just stare very, stare very intently. The Buddha should seem to loom out toward you. This has um, been called the treadmill effect. Same thing happens at the gym. You're running on the treadmill, you stop, the room seems to loom toward you. Uh, what's happening are neurons in your brain that track forward and backward motion are getting tired and beginning to uh, get confused. This happens on the road as well. It's called speed adaptation. When you've been driving at a long speed, for a long time and you're suddenly asked to enter a slower environment, uh, you often have trouble adapting. You think you've slowed more than you really have, which is why traffic engineers often have to put up these signs reminding you of, of exactly what your speed is, sort of external feedback. Um, you know, <laughs> and people have resorted to all kinds of ways to try to get drivers to slow down, to change driver behavior, uh, signage being the most uh, prevalent of these, and you know, we've all kinds of problems with signage, including the great uh, dynamic warning sign hacking epidemic of 2009. Um, my favorite study looked at a watch for falling rocks uh, sign, asked people, What would you do when you saw this sign? Half said they would slow down and look for rocks already on the road, other half said they would speed up to avoid rocks falling in the moment. Um, 
yeah, another problem, changing behavior. I mean, signs like this sort of like alert us to look how bad this behavior is, but they also sort of reinforce social norms and say, look at how many people are doing this behavior that all of you think is so bad, including probably yourself. So there's uh, getting driver, changing driver behavior is sort of a, a major uh, difficult thing to do. Uh, and when we talk about congestion, this is really sort of the idea it, it, we need to change driver behavior because, again, it's another one of these nonlinear processes. To, 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 drop, to drop traffic congestion by 15%, you don't have to remove 15% you know, of vehicles. You can remove a much smaller amount, and you'll begin to see uh, effects of that already. Interesting study done in Massachusetts recently used cell phone data, which is a very promising way to actually track uh, large-scale traffic movement at, all at once. And found that if you could just get you know, a certain, a small number of, of commuters in various counties around the metro, metropolitan Boston area to not drive, I think it was 1% one, 1 of drivers, you could achieve an 18% uh, improvement in traffic flow. So the question is, you know, how do you get those 18, how do you get that 1% to change? Brings up the famous tragedy of the commons, who is going to, uh, who's going to be the first one to jump, basically? And you think, you know, I, I'm one of those people who doesn't drive that much, so when I see people sitting in crowded traffic, I think, why, why are they doing that every day? How could you do that? And this is, you know, sort of a slippery thing about human behavior. You can't just assume that as bad as traffic gets that people are going to automatically migrate to mass transportation because we, we make decisions based on a number of uh, imperfect factors. And the next video I want to show you, uh, I think, speaks to uh, that, that sense. Sparkling and cascading into the winter air, a burst water main on the A406. Brake lights wink at me provocatively, seducing me into a familiar dream. The railway barrier as it falls, the majestic spilt load, a contraflow on the Bracknell Bypass, the snowbound tailback that stirs my soul. Finally, everything is still. And as I gaze across this sea of tranquility, I pray, let this moment last forever. Um, you know, this, this was a commercial that was actually made but never shown on European television uh, because it violates the principal rule of car advertising. You cannot show traffic in a car ad. Um, but it, you know, it hints at that, and the word more comfortable, you know, sort of is a very powerful thing there because you know, a lot of what we're doing is simply sitting, and if you can make the car more like a home, uh, you know, that's a good thing. So just just conclude with um, a message from Henry Barnes, former tra traffic commissioner from my hometown, New York City. This quote from him, he was writing in the 1950s, so as you can imagine, the technology has gotten a lot more advanced, and I think this, the, the, the problems have only become uh, that much more surreal. And I will uh, conclude there, and thank you for your, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you.